park called Boone's Lick is extensive and embraces all the settlements on the Missouri River and its tributary streams west of the old counties of St. Louis and St. Charles. Its length on the Missouri is also about 140 miles and its depth back is various depending on the extent of the timber and other inducements to settlement. Immigration in this tract of country commenced in the year of 1810, but on account of its being its insulated wilderness, the difficulty of obtaining provisions, and subsequently to its being the scene of an exterminating Indian warfare, it was not considerable until the fall of the year 1816. For about two years during the last war, the people were closely confined to forts, never dared to venture out without their rifles, and suffered the extremes of Indian cruelty and depredation. But whenever the Indians did mischief, volunteers from the various forts embodied, pursued, and fought them, by which they were rendered timid and cautious. It was owning to almost unparalleled intrepidity and courage and enterprise of those men that the settlement was saved from ruin and dispersion. of trading for horses and mules and catching wild animals of every description that we may think advantageous to this company. Section 1, every man will fit himself for the trip with a horse, a good rifle, and as much ammunition as the company may think necessary for a tour of three months trip and sufficient clothing to keep him warm and comfortable. Every man will furnish an equal part in the fitting out of trade and receive an equal part of the product. If the company consists of 30 or more men, $10 a man will answer to purchase the quantity of merchandise required to trade on. A company of 17 men at Ezekiel Williams Farm on the 4th of August destined to the westward. William Becknell was chosen unanimously as the captain of the company. On 18th instant, we were all to meet at Mr. Shaw's in Franklin where two lieutenants will be elected. We have concluded that 30 men will constitute a company sufficiently strong to proceed as far as we wish to go. All those who signed their names to the first article and did not appear on the fourth of this month are excluded from going in this company and excused from paying any fine. On the first day of September, the company will cross the Missouri at Arrow Rock. Any person who wishes to go will do well to meet at this place, appointed on the 18th. No signers will be received after that day. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Flowers, and I'm a member of the Arrow Rock Stock and Trade Company. Uh, we hail from the Boone's Lick, that area to the west of this settlement. And I'd like to introduce my compatriots, and we're going to talk about the Santa Fe Trail and Santa Fe Trade from the Boone's Lick to Santa Fe and Taos in Mexico. So first up, Captain R. R. Hart, R. S. Hart, and he's going to talk about our trade uh, and Becknell as it comes out of Air Rock heading for Mexico. With Captain Hart. During the Spanish colonial time, the New Mexican provinces were very, very far removed from Mexico proper. There was 2,500 miles from Veracruz, which was the, the uh, port of entry into Mexico, up to Santa Fe. And so those people were extremely isolated. They didn't get a lot of support by the Spanish government. California was also very isolated, but they had a cover, so items could come in from ships. But to get from Chihuahua up to um, Santa Fe, was around a thousand miles and it was over and just a completely desolate desert that was completely controlled by the Apaches. So the bottom line was the people in New Mexico, what we call today New Mexico, the northern provinces of uh, Spanish colonial Mexico, couldn't get anything. They had really no furniture in their houses. Uh, they lacked tools, they lacked material, they lacked almost everything of daily essentials. So, 
it was potentially a very fertile trade for the Americans because Western Missouri is only 800 miles away, much closer than Mexico City in their route. But Spain, like other European powers, had a economic policy towards their colonies, which they called mercantilism, which means their colonies were prevented from trading with other countries. Everything had to go through Spain. Britain had the same thing towards the American colonies, which is one of the uh, issues that irritated the Americans and added to our revolution, was because they wouldn't let us trade with other countries. They had to control everything. That way they could control the resources of the colony, and the colonists were basically a, 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 an audience, a captured audience. They, had, they couldn't go anywhere else. And also, another problem was for the New Mexicans, anything they wanted to buy from Mexico, they got gouged by the Mexicans down in Chihuahua. They, could, they were a monopoly. Uh, and I say Mexicans, I mean Spanish at this point. They had a monopoly, they could charge whatever they want. So they were starved for goods. So in 1812, a couple of guys named James Baird and Robert McKnight from Franklin, from the Blue Flag, had heard about the Doggo's Declaration of Independence. So they thought Mexico was in a head from Spain, so they decided they'd go down there for some goods to Santa Fe and see if they could get a license to trade. Well, when they got down there, they found out that Hidalgo had been executed, the royalists were back in charge, and they were under arrest. They were thrown in jail in Santa Fe, transferred to Chihuahua and Durango and uh, Mexico City, where they spent nine years in a Spanish prison. They didn't get released until 1821, when Mexico actually got its independence. So, then we'll come to, to William Becknell, William McNeil was originally from Virginia. He had a father and a couple of brothers who served in the, uh, a couple of uncles, I guess, that served in the American Revolution. Um, not a whole lot is known about his background. He was in St. Louis by 1810. When the War of 1812 broke out, which on the Missouri frontier was known as the Indian War, because they really didn't fight the British, um, McNeil joined in the Missouri Rangers and was the first sergeant in uh, Nathan Boone's Ranger Company, spent two years fighting the war. Then sometime after the war, he moved out west into the Boone's Lake. He was there by, by 1817 because there's records of him buying property in 1817. So he bought property out there. He went into business with the salt works, the Boone's Lake salt works, which Daniel Boone's sons had started, had been bought out by a couple of brothers named uh, Morrison. And he went into business with them. He ran the ferry at Arrow Rock. He uh, ran for uh, office in the, for the legislature of Howard County in 1820 against 38 other candidates. And, and he didn't win. And that cost him a lot of money. Well, at this time, there was very little species of hard currency in the United States, and especially in Missouri. Everything was bought on credit or using banknotes that were issued by state banks. Banknotes which were not backed by gold and silver. The thing that, that supported the state bank's notes was the second bank of the United States. Well, because of a lot of, like a lot of depressions, there are a lot of economic factors that cause a depression. And there was a, a basic depression, it was called the Panic of 1819, where basically the bank, there had been a lot of land speculation, the Bank of the United States cut that off, the second bank of the United States. So they would no longer back the currency that all these state banks had been issued. So basically currency was worthless. Currency was worthless and there was no money. So people, merchants couldn't sell their goods, farmers couldn't sell their crops. People like Bettnell who had three or four loans and he bought $100 here, $200, couldn't pay his debts. So in May of 1821, he was arrested by the sheriff and put in jail for non-payment of his debts. Fortunately, he was bailed out by a friend. So that's when he did the uh, advertisement in June of that year. He wanted to go to the West, take 30 to 70 guys, and the, the purpose of his trip, there's a lot of controversy because he didn't say much. What he said before and what he said later 
were totally different. Before, when he advertised, all he advertised for was going out west and trading for furs and animals, presumably with the, with the native tribes, with the Indians. Uh, others say, well, he must have known he was going to, to Santa Fe because he headed right to Santa Fe. That's, that's where he was. He didn't head out to the plains when the plains got there. So he did leave on uh, September 1st. He crossed the Aramont Ferry. He only had five other guys. They didn't have 30 or 70. There were six of them. And they were pack, had pack horses, not mules, but they had basically cloth. What it was was just textiles. Cloth imported from England. That's what they took out there to trade with whoever they were going to trade with. It was a long and extremely difficult trip. There was a lot of sickness. There was a lot of rain. There was a lot of cold. They had a lot of problems. There were places uh, when they got down into New Mexico where they barely could get their horses up through a cliff. They got into a canyon and had extreme difficulty getting out of this canyon. Finally, in November, two and a half months later, they got to a close to a little village in New Mexico and ran into a troop of 400 now Mexican troops. And, you know, their initial thought was, well, this is it, we're done, you know, we're going to jail. And when the soldiers got there, the captain, Captain Gallagher, couldn't speak any English and no, could not speak Spanish. But he wrote in his journal that the reception was so positive he knew they were going to be okay. So this captain took them back to a little village where Becknell hired a Frenchman with whom he could speak a little bit because French was widely spoken in Missouri at that time. Who took him on into Santa Fe and he got there on November, November 16th. He was met with wild joy and speculation by the people that now the Americans were finally here and that we can trade with the Americans and we can get what we need. He met with the governor. The governor was very positive. He said, I want to keep an open intercourse with the United States. I encourage all of you people to come down here and, and migrate down to Mexico. Uh, so it was a very positive reception. He was only there for three weeks when he finally sold out his goods. And he wasn't the only one because two weeks after he was there, another group of Americans that had come from Fort Smith, Arkansas, arrived in Santa Fe. And so what he got was species. He didn't get animals, he didn't get furs. What he traded for were milled Spanish silver dollars. You've heard of the pieces of eight from the pirate days? Well, they would break this, this dollar was like way too much money to spend. It's like having a thousand dollar bill and you can break it down. So they would cut it into eight pieces. Each piece was called a real, is worth 12 and a half cents. And that's what a piece of hay is that you always heard about. So they came back, they had an a, a easier trip back. He got back to, he left about middle of December. He got to Boonville or Franklin, Missouri on January the 30th of 1822. And uh, there was an apocryphal story of. One guy quoted his father as saying that he was there when they got into town and they slid open the leather bags that contained the corn and the corn spilled the gutters in the street. So it was like the end of the rainbow, you know, it was like all of a sudden there's this infusion of actual species, actual money, you know, hard currency into the United States. So then he immediately started getting ready for his second voyage. And um, he spent three months getting ready. This time he was determined to take wagons. So he ended up with a total of 21 guys and three wagons. One of the wagons was his. So they took the, wet, the wagon route out. They left on the 22nd of May, 1823. Went back out to um, New Mexico, to Santa Fe. Sold their goods in a few weeks. One store is, and he didn't say this himself, but one estimate is that he took out $3,000 worth of goods and brought back $90,000 in profit. Now we're talking 1822. $90,000 was a fortune. And he even sold his wagon. He bought this wagon for $150 in the United States. He sold it for $700 in Santa Fe. And so they came back in horses. They brought horses back. And that became the, the uh, 
for the most part, the pattern from then on through the history of the Santa Fe Trail, they would take their goods out in wagons and they would sell their wagons while they were out there. And they would buy mules, pack mules and horses and come back because it was much, they didn't need wagons because all they were taking was furs or stock or coins. So that was 1822. In early 1823, the people, uh, Cooper family, which Cooper County, Missouri is named after, took a trip out to Santa Fe, and they brought back 400 jacks, jennies, and mules. And how they got 400 animals back across the plains without losing them all That's to the Indians and Pawnee, I don't know, but they did. And those mules that they brought back, they bred with American horses and created the famous Missouri mule. As cause of that, Missouri became the largest mule producing state of anywhere in the world. And you know, as history says, you know, 100 years later, almost by World War I, they were still pulling artillery with mules in World War I. Most of the only mules came from Missouri, and those mules originated with the ones that the Cougars had brought back. In 1824, he took a third trip out there, and he, it was, uh, they ended up with 20-something wagons and 120 men. Meredith uh, Miles Marmaduke, who became a later governor of Missouri, he went on that trip. Very prominent people in the booths like an Arrow Rock man, Augusta Stores, and a few other guys. So they went back out to Mexico with this wagon train, these 20 something wagons. And by then, so many people, now this is three years after he started, three years, the market was saturated with goods from the United States. So they had trouble selling. The Miles Marvin was out there for like six months trying to get rid of the stuff. That's when some of them decided they would go on south down that very difficult, long, dangerous road, several hundred miles to Chihuahua, and sell their goods there. And so that also became the pattern for the rest of the Santa Fe Trail, is that about half of them, by 1843, half of them would go on into Mexico, Chihuahua and North Mexico, because the market wasn't as flooded there, and there was more population, and they could sell their goods and make a higher profit. Not all of them did that, you know, about half of them stayed uh, just in Santa Fe and Taft. So the general pattern, pattern became that the wagon train, they started out in Franklin, then they moved to Lexington, then they moved to uh, Independence, and then Independence got flooded in 1833, so the main jumping off port off what became Westport, which was then downtown Kansas City, right where the Arabia was. That was Westport. That was where the, 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 the steamboats, you know, it's easier, cheaper to bring your goods from St. Louis on a steamboat than it is by wagon. So the steamboats would go as far as they could, which was to Westport, offload the goods, they put them on wagons, these various companies. The wagons would go 150 miles west to Council Groves, which is today Council Groves, uh, Kansas. And they would all form together, they would elect a captain, they would elect four lieutenants, they would cut down trees, that was the last place there was any trees until you got to New Mexico, and make extra ad axes, which they could strap underneath their wagons so if they had an axis to break, they could fix it, they wouldn't be stuck out. They would leave, usually by <clears throat> the middle to the end of May, it was about 800 miles out to Santa Fe. So they would travel six to eight weeks, depending on the weather, you know, how bad the streams were and how much rain and mud there was. They'd get there, Santa Fe, those that stayed, and <coughs> did not go to Chihuahua, would sell their goods in about four or five weeks, and their goal was to be, leave there and be headed back by September 1st. That way they could make it back to western Missouri and, and hopefully not get caught in a blizzard out there on the plains, because that happened to some. Early on, there were some people who tried to go down there, like in the winter time, and got caught and spent like months, and they had the Easter meals. Then the guy had to walk to Santa Fe and get more meals and bring back. So he did not want to get caught out on the plains in the, uh, in the winter time. And there were two two routes. To Santa Fe, there was a shorter route by about 50 miles, which was called the dry route. When they got out, dry route. When they got out to about uh, Dodge City, 
they would cut southwest down through and try to get from the Arkansas to the Seminole River, and then they would go southwest from there. The problem with that route is there's 60 miles of no water, and so it was extremely dangerous and extremely difficult. And in fact, in the beginning, some of them had a lot of trouble. In fact, that was uh, in 1831. That was the route that Jedediah Smith was on. He was looking for water when he was caught by the Comanches and killed. That was down in the very, very southwest Kansas that that took place. The other route had water because you followed the Arkansas west, and then you cut southwest from now what is now Boone to Colorado down to what is now. Trinidad, where you were, thank you. And then they would cross the Rotone Pass. <clears throat> the problem with the Rotone Pass was it was very difficult for horses to get over and it was almost impossible for wagons because it was very rocky and steep, strewn with rocks. And so it would take five days just to get through this pass because they had to push the wagons over these rocks. It was very difficult. Actually, the first person that took uh, wagons over that was Charles Bent of Bent St. Training Company, who ended up uh, being one of the persons to build Bent's Fort out in Colorado. He was the governor of occupied New Mexico during the Mexican-American War when the Mexicans revolted and he was murdered. But he was a very, very famous Santa Fe trader, Charles and William Bent, so on the same train. Bent's Fort, his fort, was built in 1833 to 1834 on that mountain. So people who took that route could stop at his fort and resupply, get fresh horses, or do what they, what they needed to do. By the late 1820s into the early 1830s, about half the traders were Mexicans themselves. Because when they, people in New Mexico saw these Americans coming down and selling all these goods, they decided, hey, this can go both, both ways. So they would go up, take their, their coins up to Missouri, buy goods, and go back down to Mexico. So it was a two-way street. In 1829, in 1828, two guys were um, out hunting. They decided to take a nap. They took a nap. They were caught by some Native Americans and ended up being killed. So that caused a big uproar. The following year, 1829, the Army made their first expedition to support the wagon train going to, uh, as far as they could, to the Arkansas River was the international boundary. They could not go all the way to Santa Fe. The Army made three trips out there, 1829, 1834, and 1843. Um, the biggest, other than Indian depredations, which usually involved, there wasn't a lot of people killed. Very few. Those two and maybe a couple of others. The biggest depredation was they would raid for the, the mules and the horses uh, from the wagon trains. So when the army went out there in 1829, they pulled their supply wagons with oxen, and everybody thought they were crazy, but it worked. So Charles Bent was the first one in 1831. He was the first one to take his wagon train out there with oxen. And by the time in the 1840s when the Santa Fe Trail was in its heyday, about half of the half of the caravans used oxen and the other half used mules. Each had their advantages, each had their disadvantages. The mules were faster, you could use them coming back, uh, but the oxen were better pulling through quicksand, and you didn't have to worry about the Indians stealing. The Indians didn't want the oxen. They wanted horses and mules. Malaria was the largest disease, the worst disease on the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, just like along the Missouri River out there in the Boone's Lake, anybody who lived there for any length of time is going to get malaria. Yeah. And so they often, because they were going along the Arkansas River where there were millions of mosquitoes, they would often get malaria. That was a problem. Sometimes smallpox was a problem. But most people by then that lived on the western Missouri frontier had been vaccinated against smallpox. So smallpox, almost all travelers on the, the Santa Fe Trail were vaccinated against smallpox. And Dr. Sappington of Arawak, who had come up with his quinine anti malaria pill, they would take those. So these were experienced travelers who knew what they were doing. 
they avoided a lot of the problems that the immigrants on the, on the Oregon Trail had later on. The biggest threat, again, back to Indians, was primarily the Pawnee. Once in a while, the Comanche would raid. Uh, in the very beginning, the Osage did. In fact, when he went down on his second trip out there, two of his guys got caught and whipped and robbed by the Osage, and it was the uh, uh, inner being of uh, Auguste Choteau who got him away. And so in 1825, when they were, the army had, uh, the government had uh, commissioned a group to plant a road to Santa Fe. They stopped in Council Grove, and they had a council with the Osage, and they made an agreement with the government. Okay, we'll give you safe passage, we won't break your wagon trains, and in fact, we'll help protect you if you will help protect us against the park. So after that, the Osage were on the American side. That's when it came to the point. They no longer made an attack. But the party did. Once they were past Council Grove, then it was over the country for whatever. Uh, the first really big year of the Santa Fe Trail was 1831. That was the year when the big, big profits started coming in. Again, because a lot of them were going down to Jamal. The, the Santa Fe Trail continued on through the Mexican American War. When that war broke out in 1846, there was a caravan getting ready to go. Uh, and the government said, oh, you know, we're at war with that country. We're not going down there and trade with so they worked out a deal. They had formed an army, about 900 goons under an army officer, and the 1st Missouri Mounted Volunteer uh, Regiment under Alexander Dodson, who was a lawyer from Liberty, Missouri. They went with the caravan to Santa Fe. They stopped at Lynn's Fort, they re-outfitted. They headed on to Santa Fe. The army had some confrontations, some minor confrontations, with the uh, Mexican army, but basically the government just surrendered. So the Americans uh, captured that territory during the Mexican-American War. Then Donovan's group and the caravan later, about a month or so later, continued all down to Chihuahua, where the traders traded as a head for years, and he went on and marched to Mexico. So the, the Mexican-American War did not, did not upset the trade or upset the um, uh, trade along the Santa Fe Trail. It kept going. It kept going during the Civil War. The Confederates had made an attempt to conquer uh, New Mexico. They had some skirmishes and then they had a big battle at a place called the Boyan Pass where they got beat and defeated and never were a threat to the, the Santa Fe Trail again at all. The Santa Fe Trail continued from 1821 into the 1880s the railroad was finally put through the Santa Fe, and of course that put the end to the wagon. So, what I was going to say too earlier, when all this currency started to come out, remember, the Panic of 1819, the Missouri's in depression, the country's in depression. When all this hard currency came back with Beck Bell and the other guys in 1821, 1822, 1822, it literally revived the economy and pulled Missouri out of the depression which helped pull the rest of the entire nation out of the depression. So the Santa Fe Trail had a significant economic impact on the United States, not just Missouri, but all of the United States. Since we're here talking about rifles, um, I had always read that uh, in the, you know, the fur trade, Mount Man era, which is my area of interest, there were a lot of people here, that the mountain man always, even after the advent of percussion guns, they always preferred flint guns. I read that in several sources because they were out there all year. And if they ran out of caps, they were done. You know, you could always find a piece of flint. They weren't well resupplied except during the rendezvous, during the summer, or if they went to a, a trading post. Well, it was different on the Santa Fe train. They had wagons. They were, you know, only going to go for eight weeks and then they were going to be in Santa Fe. So they didn't have to worry about that. And so they actually preferred uh, uh, Kaplan guns. Josiah Gregg, which who made three or four trips out there, was the captain of the caravan of time too. He wrote a book published in 1844 called Commerce and Prairie. And he stated in his book, because the wind was so bad, it would blow the powder out of your paint. 
And so the traders on the Santa Fe Trail preferred Capitol Um That's pretty much the uh, history of, in a nutshell of the Santa Fe Trail. Our group, we're an old Civil War reenactment group, which, you know, I've started back in, you know, 1983, and I'm so, um, We had done a few, a couple of three uh, Civil War events in Arrow Park State Historic Society in Saline County. And in 1850, 19, excuse me, 2000, I got my century screen up. 2015, we converted over to be doing uh, Santa Fe Trail living history because that town is really more known a lot of you here with the friends more known for santa fe trail stuff than the city there's not a lot going on in the city i think the yankees hang one for father who they accused of giving aid to the to the grants but that, i think and they might have been one stroke but that was it the santa fe trail and the oregon trail were big things in Aaron Rockets. so we felt that we would have more to offer as living historians to the state historic site in the community by doing Santa Fe Trail. We are we are the only Santa Fe Trail reenactment group in the entire country. And you wouldn't tell the Vince Ford story unless sure. my, my throat's given out. So we uh, we uh, had an opportunity last fall the Santa Fe Trail Association had their bicentennial 2021, 200 years since we have checked out started the Santa Fe Trail. He's the father of the Santa Fe Trail. And so the Santa Fe Trail Association had a uh, symposium out of Vince Fort in Colorado, Vince Fort National Historic Site now, uh, celebrating that. And we ended up, through a long process, getting to go, and there's some pictures here, all that line going to that. Thank you very much. Well, I have some questions for you. Yeah, not much more to add, but uh, like Steve said, uh, our little group uh, was chosen by the National Park Service and the uh, uh, Santa Fe Trail Association to be special interpreters at this event. And so we went out there, you see some pictures there. Uh, Bid Sports a really neat place. Uh, a lot of great interpreters. Uh, and we literally saw thousands of people the week that we were there doing these programs. Uh, we saw thousands of people, including, I think one day we had 600. Uh, school kids, so yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So there's some, yeah, there's some, they shot some great video. Uh, um, one of the unique thing is uh, the guys down here with the boat, okay, Bill Bailey built that boat. Before Bill Bailey built that boat, he built what we call a St. Louis cart. So a two uh, wheeled cart, wooden cart that was. Uh, pulled by horse or mule. they bring them out from St. Louis uh, during the fur trade period a little later. But those carts were just designed to go to the west and they were never designed to come back. Well, Bill built one out in Colorado and we were lucky enough to acquire that cart. And so it's part of our living history. And you can see the picture of the car on the, on the board there. Uh, we utilize this cart to talk about the trade goods that were taken and uh, how, they, uh, how they transport them. And then, uh, also, as part of this living history, uh, we took that cart uh, into the fort and portrayed travelers and traders arriving with all these goods. So, really neat stuff. If you get a chance to go out, I would encourage you to do so. But thanks for listening to, to us and, and especially Steve. Steve's the, our premier historian on the Santa Fe Trail. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.